Looking for a solid chameleon care guide? Stick around, we'll tell you everything that you need to know. Hey guys, how's it going and welcome back to the channel. Now if you're new here, and I know a bunch of you are because uh, that graph right there, make sure if you enjoy this video, head down there, press that subscribe button, all that good stuff, let's get into it. Now today we are going to be going over how to care for a chameleon or chameleon care guide. In this care guide we'll be going over the five main topics, that being the enclosure size, heating and lighting, the humidity levels you need, the proper diet for a chameleon, and then lastly, what to fill the enclosure with. Kicking things off, let's start with number one, the enclosure size for your chameleon. When it comes to the enclosure size of the chameleon, that is going to really depend on the age of the chameleon. Of course, baby chameleon starting out this big and then getting somewhere around this big is the size of the enclosure is going to be drastically changed from that. In this specific scenario, it's going to be more of a uh, do as I say, not as I do type of deal. Uh, personally, for me, when I brought my baby chameleon, I actually ended up putting him in this 4x2x2, by two by two, the one directly behind me, where he's been in for quite a couple of weeks, I believe uh, five, six, seven weeks now, somewhere around that uh, timeline. Uh, honestly, if you're not experienced with chameleons, this is actually the third chameleon I've owned. I I'm a little bit versed with chameleons after talking to the guy. We did get it a little bit too. It's a little bit easier for him instead of putting him in just this bare 4x2x2. Two by two by two. We have it pretty decked out with a bunch of plants a live plant, some fake plants, twigs, stems, everything like that. Of course, we've got the background making him feel a little bit more secure. But as far as being the new chameleon owner or just getting into working with chameleons, I would not suggest going with this route. Now, with all that being said, depending on the age of your chameleon, whether it's a tiny little baby or getting a little bit older, I do recommend a smaller enclosure, something like the small zoom in screen enclosure. I can't remember the exact dimensions, but here's a little pop-up right here going with that. And as the chameleon gets a little bit older, up into that sub-adult size, I do believe believe at that point you can move them into something like a 4x2x2. By two by two. Of course the or the 2x2x4, two by two by uh, of course being that minimum size for a veiled chameleon, I really wouldn't opt for anything lower. I know some people put them in the 18x18x36, 18 by 18 by however with a chameleon being at the size of, well, an adult veiled really is, I do believe that the 18x18 18 18 is just a tad too small and I would opt as a minimum size of course being that enclosure right behind me. In my opinion, the 2x2x4 two by two by is really the best route to go. Bigger is always better when you have an adult chameleon, of course they're in there from most of the time uh, with chameleons you really don't really want to handle them too much they get stressed very easily yada 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 that's another video for another day however with this 2x2x4 two by two by you're gonna have a chameleon that's able to have a lot of room to roam around chameleons can be quite active especially or this personally with my veiled chameleon even at this size I see him going all around the enclosure all day rummaging around we've got some loose crickets in there that he enjoys trying to catch things like that there's a lot of mental enrichment in there of course the live plants and the branches and so on so 2x2x4 two by two by that's gonna be your minimum size. If you are working with a baby chameleon, I do recommend something a little bit smaller until they get to that sub-adult size. Moving on, let's get into the next topic, which is actually a two-part topic, and that's going to be number two, heating and lighting for your veiled chameleon. Kicking things off, let's start with heating. Now, when it comes to heating with the veiled chameleon, you do want a two distinct temperatures. That's going to be your basting temp versus your ambient temps. Now, unlike most chameleons, the veils do actually like it a little bit warmer. Oh, with that being said, you're gonna want a basting spot somewhere in that 85 degrees to 90 area. Of course, when we're talking about basking temperatures, we're talking about the actual surface temperature that the animal can bask itself on. Uh, personally, for me, I have that as a little twig stand over there. We got a little branch that sections out in the corner where the basking light is specifically on, where that animal can go over there that does reach that, again, 85 to 90 degrees. Of course, that is only one half of the equation. The second part of the equation being ambient heating. Now, ambient heating is going to be a little bit more different than your basking temperatures. If you're a little new to reptile husbandry, that basking temperature is pretty going to be that one spot where the animal can go up and bask on. Ambient heating is going to be the temperature around, so the air temperature there is. Rather, where basking is usually uh, measured by a digital uh, thermostat, the infrared with little laser ones, whereas ambients are going to be regulated by your air temperature, a little air thermometer, the one with the little probe, the digital one, something like this is the ones that I recommend. Now, you're going to want there somewhere around 80 to 72 degrees, and what I mean by that is providing a temperature gradient. A temperature gradient is when you have basically a heat to cold side, hot to cold. So uh, the above, where you know that basting temperature is, with chameleons are being arboreal, you're going to want that temperature going this way instead of 
it this way. Uh, you're going to want the temperatures more higher up around the enclosure, pretty much on, I'll give a little demonstration. Over here on this part, you're going to want that around the 80 degrees for ambient temps. And as the enclosure goes lower and lower, of course, the temperature is going to drop more and more, going from that 80 degrees to 75, 73, and then finally the bottom being 72. This is going to help the animal regulate its temperature. So if it's too hot in the basking spot, of course, those 80 degrees ambient, it doesn't feel like it wants to be that warm. It can actually go lower into the lower section of the enclosure where it can cool off, have some shade. Of course, we also provide some pothos to get away from the UVB, uh, things like that. Being, making sure that the animal has a bunch of different temperature layouts or microclimates that it can prefer rather than just being forced to sit at this uh, standard temperature. Now, when it comes to the heating element, I always prefer basking lights. Uh, personally, for me, I use PAR 38 floodlights. I like the floodlights the best. They give a nice expansion of that light cycle versus your standard reptile bulb that usually acts more as a spotlight versus a floodlight, so it's a more centered area. I find basking bulbs, as far as the reptile store brands, they tend to burn out a lot quicker than, say, your PAR 38 floods. You can grab those in any, like, home improvement store, Home Depot, Lowe's, anything like that. Uh, but I do recommend the basking bulbs itself. I don't like using any other heating elements. I know there's um, CHEs, I, I guess, like, heat tape or radiant heat panels. I, I don't think those really work very well with chameleons. I don't opt for those. Really, when it comes to the temperature and heating your chameleon, uh, basking lights are really the way to go for that. I can't really give a clear answer on what wattage to use. That's really going to depend on a bunch of things. Someone that is up in, you know, Montreal, Canada, where the temperatures are wildly different than somewhere in Arizona, are, of course, going to need different types of bulbs. Uh, you're going to need hotter bulbs in the colder climates, uh, smaller wattages in the warmer climates. It really depends on what your ambient temperatures are, what the temperatures in your house. If you're living in a house where you don't like using heat and it's constantly 60 degrees, then you're going to want to opt for a larger basking bulb and maybe actually more basking lights to make sure that the chameleon has those correct temperatures. Uh, or if you're in somewhere like Southwest Florida or Southern Florida, where the temperatures are constantly hot, you're going to want to use a smaller wattage bulb to still get those temperatures, but just making sure that they're right. That's, you know, it's a little trial and error when it comes to basking bulbs, but honestly, just keep doing the best ones. Keep switching them out. You might have to make some returns or maybe switch some bulbs around until you get to the optimal one that provides those temperatures for your chameleon. Now getting into the second part of this equation, and personally, in my opinion, the more important part is going to be UVB. Now, UVB is absolutely essential for the care of chameleons. These guys seem to be a bit of a more sensitive species and really need a lot more time in tweaking their individual care. Uh, again, it's in my opinion, that the UVA and UVB rays are absolutely important. Of course, UVA being spawned from the basting light and then UVB being spawned from a UVB bulb. Not only do you need the UVB bulb instead of opting not to get it again, you must get the UVB bulb. You actually do need a specific type of UVB. Now, there are a bunch of different ones on the market. You got your coils, you got your compacts, you got your linears. Of course, finding those into the T8s and the T5s. Uh, however, honestly, coils and compacts, alpha for a chameleon, not enough UVB span. You're gonna get such a short window of UVB, especially when you're talking about such a deep enclosure or tall enclosure as a four foot one, it's just not gonna provide enough UVB. Uh, going into the linears, they're gonna be a better option. Personally, I don't like the T8s, especially if you're putting it overhead on top of the screen. A lot of that screen is gonna filter out those UVB rays, and in my opinion, it's just too weak of a bulb to penetrate further enough for your chameleon to actually thrive in that type of setup. So really, the best bet for you is going to be that T5 high output bulb multiple brands that provide this UVB T5, the HO bulb, but the two that I strongly recommend are going to be Zoomed, and then my number one go-to, Arcadia. Arcadia really knows that if you UVB bulb, right, it's a little bit more expensive. However, from studies of using solar meters, things like that, we have found that Arcadia bulbs do last a lot longer than the Zoomed. So while Zoomed prices with their UVB bulbs do seem to be a little cheaper, of course this bulb does need to be changed. This isn't a type of bulb where you can just turn it on, get it going, and then you're good to go. Uh, they do actually have a lifespan by producing these UVB rays. Now when it comes to Zoomed, those UVB rays actually only seem to last around the six month period. It starts to weaken out and actually stop producing UVB. Whereas the Arcadia bulbs seem to last a lot longer spanning over around the recommended changing of 12 months, which is double the amount of time that you get out of the Zoomed bulb. It's even been shown that with the Arcadia, they actually go longer than 12 months. However, if you don't have anything like a solar meter, I recommend playing it safe and getting the Arcadia changed bulb around the that 
12 month period. This is something you need to keep an eye out. This isn't gonna be one of those scenarios where let's take the zoom in for example, after six months, the bulb's gonna turn a different color or just turn off. Uh, no, you actually don't actually visually see the difference of the UV UVB rays uh, being decreased. It kind of just happens almost invisibly unless you're using something again, like a solar meter to actually measure the UVB rays in that output. Uh, you gotta just put a little date. Luckily they do have on the bulb, they actually have a little square where you can put the month and date uh, when the bulb was changed. But I recommend just going to like Google uh, Calendar, something on your phone, giving you a reminder six months later that these bulbs do actually do need to be replaced. But moving on, we still got a couple more things to talk about, and that's going to be number three, the humidity levels your community requires to properly care for it. Funny enough, in most of my videos, I kind of just brush off over humidity. I say the range and then you're good to go. However, chameleons being well, chameleons being more of a difficult species, we actually got to go a little bit more in depth into the humidity levels for your chameleon. Of course, veils being a little bit more of a drier species, they are going to require a little bit less humidity. You're going to want those ranges in the 50 to 65% area. However, with that being said, you do not want that humidity at a constant level. That's going to be vastly different than just your standard animal where you just missed it, you get the humidity levels and you keep it at that. No, chameleons, especially veiled chameleons, but really any chameleon species do require a temperature or a humidity die off. That being from spiking it to that 50-65%, getting it a little bit high, and then gradually having it drop off as the day goes on. To take that one step further, you're going to do it actually opposite from most species. Of course, with most uh, diurnal species, uh, animals or reptiles that are awake during the day that do require the more of a tropical mindset, you usually mist in the morning. You give them a heavy misting and then that dies off during the day and that night and you're good to go. However, chameleons are a little bit different. I actually, and again, personally, this is what I do for my chameleon, I actually give them the heavy missing, make sure those humidities are spiked up during night. Pretty much right before the lights go off is when I give that heavy missing, make sure that humidity is spiked and then let it go off during the night and then to morning. Find the humidity gradient and the humidity drop off to be very important for the health of the chameleon and getting it thrive, of course, those older ages. Again, you know, chameleons, you know, being somewhat of a shorter lifespan, usually around five to 10 years is somewhere around that part. If you are doing everything right, uh, proper vitamin supplements, of course, UVB, proper temperatures, and again, proper humidity, you are gonna get that longer lifespan versus the shorter lifespan out of your chameleon. I guess to clump this in, we should talk about watering and hydrating your chameleon. Your chameleon does not see standing water. This isn't going to be a species you can just put a water bowl in there and call it a day. Uh, nine times out of ten, they actually won't go on the ground to drink water. Uh, mostly, chameleon's going to get most of their hydration through lapping up the dew off a of plant. Now, this is one of those reasons, we'll talk about it a little bit later, why I do believe live plants are very essential for chameleons. It's going to be a lot easier to have that dew stick on uh, the live plants. They're going to get better at holding in that humidity, of course, being a screen enclosure, making sure you have the well-ventilated air area, uh, you're going to want some humidity. You're going to want it to retain a little humidity better. I think live plants play a vital role in that. Now, there are a couple of ways to make sure that your chameleon is properly hydrated. Uh, I guess three big ones. That's going to be manually missing, just spraying the enclosure, um, I guess, multiple times a day. Uh, number two is going to be some sort of dripper system, like the zoom in one right here. There also are DIY options if you want to look into that. Basically, it's just a hole with a big water reservoir that just slowly drips water out of it, it drips on the plants, the chameleon sees that, it laps up the plants and so on. The third and most beneficial one is actually going to be some sort of misting system. Now personally for me, I had the misting that I was using for a minute, uh, however it actually broke. I'm waiting on some parts to replace it and I'm actually back to manually misting, which is a real bummer. Uh, I don't really recommend manual misting if you don't work from home like I do. It can be a real pain having to do it, get back from work, you know, end of the day. It's a lot of stuff. I do opt, I think the mist king and really any misting system is your best bet. It makes it fully automated. You know your chameleon's getting the right hydration. You can set different times, anything like that. Here's a little Amazon thing going on for some of those. Uh, but yeah, hydration for chameleons pretty easy. Then rounding down our list, we only have a couple more things to talk about, and that is going to bring us to number four, the diet for the Veiled Chameleon. When it comes to the diet for the Veiled Chameleon, this is probably one of the easier parts to go with. Of course, being insectivores, you're going to be wanting to give a variety of insects, that being in the families of roaches, uh, you know, orange head, lobsters, red runners, dubia, uh, crickets, and then more of a treat is going to be like waxworms and superworms. Now, of course, with any reptile, you're going to want a large variety of stuff. You do not want to stick to one staple. You want to give them a bunch of choices. Of course, each animal getting a little bit different, roaches being higher in protein, uh, waxworms being higher in fat, and so on. Uh, again, 
I actually just point this out with black zones and super rooms, you do want to make sure that you are getting uh, a little bit more of a rarity and a treat, an occasional uh, food item to give, just giving that more variety for it. But using too much can lead to ill effects such as obesity and fat or liver, fatty liver disease, just to name a couple of things. Before we move on to our last category, we do need to talk about supplementation and multivitamins. Now, of course, with most reptiles and especially, especially chameleons, it is vitally important to use multivitamin supplements, whether that being your th three big things, that being calcium, calcium with D3, and then a multivitamin supplement. Uh, personally, for me, I use RepCal. However, I don't notice too big of an issue with other brands. You can leave me a comment if that's wrong and some brands are better. However, I think they all kind of do the same thing. That's just my uh, personal opinion on the matter. Uh, here's a little schedule right here. I'll pop it up right there instead of explaining everything on what you want to do. Of course, calcium should be given pretty frequently. The calcium with D3, as long as you're using the UVB rays, which you absolutely do need to use UVB, you'll be using that calcium with D3 a little bit more sparingly. And then finally, the multivitamins, usually somewhere around that once to twice, um, twice a month area. But alrighty folks, we almost got everything we need to know how to take care of a chameleon. We got the enclosure size, heating, lighting, the humidity levels, and finally the diet. There's just one last thing we need to talk about. That of course is going to be number five, what to fill the enclosure with for your veiled chameleon. When it comes to filling the enclosure for the veiled chameleon, it's a little bit self-explanatory. Of course, chameleons having these weird crab-like legs, uh, you're not gonna really be doing anything for the bottom. In fact, most people actually opt, including myself, opt to not use any substrate whatsoever for the chameleon. You do risk things such as impaction, especially in smaller chameleons when they're shooting that tongue out. If something is on the ground, they get that big load of a cocoa fiber, topsoil, whatever that substrate you're going to be use. It's it's just not worth it in my opinion. It doesn't really do anything because chameleons spend most of their time up here. You're not, just because you're like opting for some more humidity on the bottom, it's not gonna really transfer very well up being a completely screened enclosure for the most part. So it's not really gonna do it. I just opt for no substrate. And what you're really gonna wanna be using is going into it, uh, live plants. There are absolutely a multitude of live plants you can use for your chameleon. In fact, there's kind of too many to list. I know over at Neptune the Chameleon, which is an absolute fantastic chameleon channel, now, she goes very in-depth on live plants, things like that, and honestly, that's the channel to go to if you want to learn more about in-depth chameleon care. It's kind of just a basic care guide. All in all, I can tell you what I'm using personally. That's going to be really two things, pothos and then an umbrella plant. I like the umbrella plant staging at the bottom because it gives a little bit more width and density, making sure that it doesn't look a little bit too empty down there. And then, of course, that sprouts up. Now, as it gets larger and larger as the plant grows, of course, you're using some nice plant lights. We just have some CFL plant lights going on. That will grow and fill out the enclosure more and more as time goes on and then pothos doing pretty much the exact opposite. I hang pothos at the top. You can see it right in the corner right there and the vines are gradually going to grow lower and lower just making a cool little jungle area for them. I know my chameleon really loves climbing up the stems of the umbrella plant and the vines of the pothos. I think those are two really great options. There are a multitude of things you can use though but plants those are my two go-tos. Pothos and umbrella. They're pretty easy to care for rather than other plants. Your boy doesn't really have a green thumb, so pothos with anything is pretty much my go-to in these kinds of situations. And then lastly, you're going to need a variety of different sticks. Uh, now, when it comes to sticks or branches, however you want to call it, you want them spanning both vertically and horizontally. Vertically and horizontally, there we go. Uh, this is going to give your chameleon more stuff to climb on. It can climb up, it can climb sideways. I like using different size branches, so he's not just constantly on that one thing. He gets a little bit more grip. Some are smaller, some are larger, uh, things of that note. Now, personally for me, I opted to do a complete custom background for my chameleon. I go a little bit more in depth in that in that video right here. Uh, however, most people don't have this. I do like opting for some sort of background or um, somewhat of a half and half enclosure instead of a full screen. It keeps that humidity in a little bit better while still providing that excellent ventilation being the front opening screen. Uh, I can't remember the brand name. I'll try to put it right here if I can remember it. Those things are awesome. However, if you are using, or well, I guess with the background, I kind of just cemented these things into it. So you have a bunch of these little branches are actually engraved into the background itself. That was a conscious decision. And then other than that, I just zip tied some stuff over to the pothos. I zip tied some branches together. So he has a little bit of some sort of a jungle gym theme going on with that. However, if you are using screen, you can just usually zip tie it to the screen itself. I know there are also some, um, 
There's some sort of things you can put, it's like a magnetic holder that you can place branches and like dowel rods on. Again, I think Neptune did a video on that. I just, I opted for the background, so this is kind of like my go-to on how I know how to create a chameleon enclosure. And lastly, folks, before I wrap this video up is going to be the little bonus tip. That's going to be enjoy your chameleon, man. Now, while these guys are a bit of a more sensitive species and um, I guess harder to care for all in all, and they do have a bit of a shorter lifespan comparatively speaking to reptiles, it is such a rewarding species to work with. I absolutely adore chameleons. I really never have a time where I don't have at least one chameleon I'm working with. They're an absolutely incredible species. And while maybe not in such of a breeding project for mine, I know as time goes on, I will always carry at least one chameleon because I just can't get enough of them. They are an absolutely incredible species. Well guys, that is gonna wrap up the video for today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought about this care guide. Did I knock it out of the park? Is it a, is it a winner? Is this a winner of a care guide? Or did I mess some things up? Did I miss some stuff? Let me know in the comment section. And of course, other than that, if you'd like to find me on a couple more social media stuff, we've got Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. If you want to buy some reptiles that I produce, you're going to find me on Facebook and Instagram for those babies available. But we still have one more thing to talk about, and that, of course, is going to be Patreon. Patreon.com slash DBCBExotics. This is where you get the up-to-date updates on everything going on within my breeding business. This includes a plethora of products we got and go, got going on, including New Caledonian geckos, ball pythons, toke geckos, Chinese cave geckos, monitor lizards. I already said ball pythons. A bunch of stuff we are doing over here at DBC Bizarre. You don't want to miss it. At Patreon, you get the first updates on everything that's going on. Not to mention first dibs on the babies I produce and even at the higher tiers, discounts on the animals I produce frequently. It's all well and good. Starts as low as $1 a month. If you want to check that out or get some more information, you can find that down there in the description below. We got some shoes. We got some reptile enclosures down there if you want to check that out as well. Well, guys, that's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to follow me over here at DBCB Exotics. We will see you next time. But until then, goodbye.